Hello and welcome to our broadcast, Why Your MySQL Needs Redis. It's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Roshan Kumar, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Redis Labs. If your application store stores data in MySQL or any other relational database, you will benefit by inserting Redis in between your application and the database. Today you will hear how you can complement MySQL with Redis. You will get tips for designing look aside and write through caching solutions at, and rate limiters. Today's broadcast is being recorded. Following today's event, an email with a link to the recording will be sent to you for sharing with your fellow workmates. There is a question and answer feature in the control panel to post questions. All questions will be answered in the order that they are received. And at the end of the broadcast, we will be raffling off two $100 Amazon gift cards and two free passes to Redis Conf 18. To be eligible, you must be present to win. If your name is called, please, please post a note in the question and answer control panel. Again, thank you for joining us today. And at this time, I'll turn the broadcast over to Rashan. Rashan, take it away. Hello, everybody. Thanks for taking time to join this webinar. Uh, we have a very interesting topic today. And as you can see in the agenda, the core topic for today is how you can use Redis as a complementary database to your existing uh, relational database, which could be MySQL or any other database. Um, but before we do that, um, we'll set the stage. Let's look at some of the challenges most enterprises face today. Uh, and then I'll give a very quick introduction to Redis um, and why Redis with MySQL. And this is in the interest of those who are new to Redis. And if you have any questions, please post questions in the Q&A panel and I'll take your questions at the end. Okay, okay let's start. <clears throat> now, what you see here is a very simplified view of the architecture most software applications have. Now, most enterprises have this architecture. You can minimize your architecture into what you see here. Now here, you have a database that will serve data to a few applications um, and Typically, there is a data access layer or data link layer that abstracts uh, all the conversations between uh, the application and the database. And there are, of course, end users who get um, to use the applications. Okay, now with this scenario, what, what happens? What's the, what are the challenges you face? Main, the problem with your architecture is it has to adapt to more users. Or a period of time you get more users and also uh, with the same infrastructure you add more applications and more features and over a period of time with more users and more applications you have more data you have more tables to manage and your database grows bigger and bigger right now with this the challenges uh, i'll just present four very common challenges the first one is how do you minimize the cost of data management? You are growing fast, you're adding more users, you're adding more apps, so what happens to the data? It, first of all, it grows in volume, and then you have more tables, there's constant uh, changes happening, so you have more changes to your table structure, schema, so what was there earlier is not there today, and you have to deliver more queries, uh, and what's, what's happening here? You're, getting more data, you're delivering more queries, and you end up adding more resources uh, to manage your data. Um, now this may become cost prohibitive uh, over a period of time. The second challenge is, this is a very competitive market. And most enterprises, they have to stay in the competition, they have to stay in business. And in order to do this, they have to add New apps, they need to be agile. If they have to add new features, they have to do that very quickly. There are agile processes in place for software development, um, and your database needs to be flexible so, uh, to, to cope with all the changes happening on the application side. And uh, your development cycle should be short, lean, and easy. Challenge number three, with all this, uh, you cannot forget that you have to deliver an interactive application. The user engagement has to be awesome, 
And uh, many studies have shown that to have a good engagement, you should have very low latency, low latency as low as 200 milliseconds. But the challenge here is the network latency itself takes up most of the time. Uh, the average network latency in US is around 152 to 200 milliseconds. So uh, you're left with very, very little time on the application side to gather the data and to package all the data and deliver it to the customer. So uh, in other words, you need sub millisecond latencies in your queries. Okay, uh, challenge number four is a very interesting challenge. Um, we have a customer uh, who had this problem, uh, Home Depot. Uh, they, they added about 20, 30 new apps in one calendar year. Um, and because of that, they had more usage, they had more users and more user adoption. Um, and what was happening in the back end was their infrastructure did not grow at the same pace. It grew fast, but it did not grow at the same pace as the user base and the app base. Um, and what was happening was during peak hours, uh, if, the, if the infrastructure could support something like 30,000 ops per second, um, during peak hours, they, they were hit by something like 50,000 ops per second. Uh, and this had a cascading effect. The database slowed down and all apps and the whole experience slowed down and it was not a, a good thing to happen at all. So they had to find a way to, um, uh, to rate limit the number of calls uh, and uh, do something like traffic shaping um, uh, to, to the database calls and they were able to do that. Now, um, just to summarize, we talked about four challenges. The first one was uh, how to minimize costs as your enterprise grows. And the second one was how to add new apps and how to stay flexible. And the third challenge was how to, develop, uh, how to deliver an engagement platform. And the fourth one uh, is how to, how to live with your legacy solutions. Uh, at the same time, you can keep growing, how, how to do that. Okay, um, just to get a philosophical quote here, Lena Horn said long ago, and it's not the load that breaks you down, it's the way you carry it. Uh, this applies to our lives and also it applies to the databases and the architecture. So let's see how we can um, not break down. Redis will solve a lot of the problems, a lot of challenges that we discussed a short while ago. And we'll see some of the use cases um, which uh, you can easily uh, adopt and uh, you can save a lot of uh, time, cost, effort, and many things. So let's look at some of the use cases. Now, before we do that, let's talk about Redis. For those who are new to Redis, in the interest of those um, who are um, who have heard about Redis and not known much about Redis. Redis is an open source platform. It is an in-memory database. It has extremely high performance. And since, since it runs on RAM, uh, it has very high throughput for both read and write operations. And it's used in many use cases. We'll talk about all the use cases in a while. Um, and Redis Labs is the company that's behind this open source project. Redis Labs also delivers Redis Enterprise. Redis Enterprise uh, is for enterprises, and it delivers the same Redis, open source Redis, but with flexibility, durability, auto-scaling features, and, and a lot more, auto, um, monitoring 24 by 7 support, and a lot more that enterprises need. Now, what makes Redis so popular? Number one reason is performance. We will talk about that in a while. And number, number two reason is simplicity. Now Redis has these built-in data structures. Uh, and uh, what's nice here is you don't have to translate your data from a table to whatever other data structure that you may need. Uh, for example, if you want a unique number of email addresses, uh, you just use the set data structure. And set data structure will automatically dedupe all your data, and it will uh, have a unique list of, uh, of data, of, of email addresses. That is just an example. And there are many more data structures. Uh, extensibility. Now, Redis has an API 
for modules. So you can write your own module, for example, or, or uh, you can write your own module, or you can import an existing module. An example here is Redis Search. It's a very popular module. If you want a search engine, all you have to do is import Redis Search module to your Redis database, and your Redis database becomes a search engine. And there are many more modules. You can go to redismodules.com and uh, see if there is any module uh, that you may need for your use case. Now let's talk about performance. Redis is a very, very powerful database. And Avalon performed this benchmark a few years ago, um, the one you see on the left side. And um, what Avalon found was Redis not only had the highest throughput, it had the highest throughput with the least latency. So that's awesome. So there was no other database that came uh, even close to Redis Enterprise. The chart that you see on the right side uh, is a very interesting story. Google uh, performed this benchmark a few years ago. Um, what they wanted to show was they wanted to show that you could do 1 million writes per second on Google Cloud Platform uh, using a standard database. And in this case, they used Cassandra as the database. And in their article, they, they showed that you could deliver 1 million write ops per second um, by using 300 servers for Cassandra. Now, Couchbase took that challenge, and um, they, they demonstrated that they could do the same 1 million writes per second on the same set of data with 50 servers. And Redis Enterprise, uh, Redis Labs, did the same benchmark with the same data, with the same environment, and they delivered 1 million ops per second, 1 million writes per second with just two with just two servers. So in other words, Redis Enterprise or Redis delivers high throughput, low latency with the least number of resources. Okay, now um, Redis is commonly used in many use cases. You can see some of the use cases here. It's uh, used, uh, as many of you know, it's used in caching. Uh, high-speed transactions, real-time analytics, messaging. There is a PubSub. We'll do a demo later today. Um, and it's used in many, many more use cases. Okay, so with that, um, let's look at some of the use cases. Now, this is the core topic for today's uh, webinar. Um, we'll discuss four use cases of, in, of having Redis in front of your traditional database, such as MySQL. The first use case is caching. The second one is session store. Third is metering, and the last is fast data ingest. And if time permits, we'll do some demos, and uh, we'll see how, how all these work. Okay, now Redis as a cache. Um, I'm sure everybody knows here uh, when is cache used. Uh, it's a tiered memory model. Uh, when you have more reads than writes on the same uh, data, you use caching. Now, as you may see on the screen, there are two popular types of cache. One is look-aside cache, uh, and then the other one is write-through cache. In a look-aside cache, uh, you don't normally write uh, any, anything. When you update any data, you update to your main database. In this case, it would be MySQL, MySQL. But when you read data, you're reading it from cache. And if there is a hit, you read that data. If there is a miss, you go and fetch that data from MySQL and store it in the cache and read that data. So for all subsequent reads, you read from cache. One important thing to note here is your data may get stale over a period of time, so you have to uh, manage that somehow. So you have to uh, time out the data that's, that's in the cache um, to, to make sure uh, your data gets constantly updated. Now in the second case, uh, it's unlikely that your data may get stale because you're writing, you're updating the data uh, on your cache too. Uh, so the data lifecycle is a little different from look aside cache. Okay, so let's look at um, some of the best practices for designing cache in Redis. First of all, um, if you're using MySQL, identify all the data that is repeatedly read by the application, uh, the data that's usually shared between all the users, identify that data. And then um, you have to identify the key format to access the cache data. Now, the idea here is you're taking the constantly read data, the repeatedly read data to your cache, and you have to access that data somehow from the cache itself. <coughs> um, so you should be able to 
access data, that data through a key, and you have to have a structure for that key. Um, you can see in this example here, uh, I have a table for products, and if I have to access the data for one of the products based on ID, say 1 million uh, three, I use a tech, I use the key, uh, which which appends product, uh, which affects the product ID to product. I have product underscore 1003 uh, in the hash data structure here. Um, you can use underscore or colon is again a popular delimiter. You can uh, you can use any delimiter. So the idea here is you have to identify the key format to access the cache data. You have to access the data quickly. And then uh, you have to have the right data structures in Redis. Um, in our example here for product metadata, I'm using the hash data structure. And um, to get all the prices, the price information, since um, my query may involve getting a list of products based on price or price differential, I'm using a sorted set data structure. So I'm using two data structures here to cache my data. The fourth um, idea here is you have to specify the time to live. We talked about stale objects or a period of time, your data may get old uh, and may go out of sync with your primary database. So you have to, um, you have to manage um, the data in your cache and you have to take it out uh, with the time to live. The fifth one is you have to decide on the eviction policy. Um, now this is different from time to live. Now eviction policy uh, um, it depends on the cache. In, in Redis, you have a few eviction policies. Uh, least recently used eviction policy is the most popular one. Um, eviction policy decides what objects to remove uh, from the cache when your cache is full. So um, you have to decide the right eviction policy for your use case when you are designing your cache. And the last thing is you have to read and write the data. You have to implement that logic in your data access layer or data link layer. So these six steps will help you design a cache uh, with least effort. If you are already using MySQL, uh, data in MySQL, you can insert Redis in front of MySQL and you can follow these six steps and uh, get your cache set up very quickly. And we'll look at some examples here. If you have um, some, these are some uh, query equivalents. Uh, it's more than equivalent, it is if you're already accessing data in MySQL, how do you do that with Redis? For example, uh, if you're accessing a row in a table, in this case, select star from product where ID is 1 million two. Uh, in Redis, the command is h get all product underscore 1 million two. So uh, this will directly get all the elements uh, from the hash data structure. So each row in your table is stored in a hash data structure in Redis, in this example. And um, the second example here is you, you are fetching just the name of a product. So when you're getting the name of a product <coughs> in Redis, you don't have to get all the elements. You, you have a command called hget. So you just do hget on the item on the, on the hash uh, element. And in that, you have to just get name. In this case, I'm, st I'm storing name as n. Um, in the short form of name, and uh, all I do is hget product underscore one million three n. Now, uh, if you want to get all the products that are priced less than three hundred monetary units, it could be dollars or any monetary unit, um, you can do that in Redis. Uh, first, you have to go to the sorted set and get all the product IDs that um, that are between zero and three hundred. Uh, you can do that by running the command z range by by score. And uh, after that, you, uh, once you fetch all the product IDs, you can pipeline uh, all your product IDs into this command, uh, into edge get all, and uh, you can get all the hash information. So you, you may want to look at this concept called pipelining in Redis. It's, it's a very important topic uh, for, for optimizing your calls to Redis. <coughs> right, um, there are more examples here. Um, this is uh, for write through cache. How do you write data back to cache? So if you're using a write-through cache, uh, whenever you insert um, a row, a new row in your table, uh, in the Redis equivalent here is you have to first create a new hash, uh, and then you have to add, um, uh, add this item to the sorted set. And here, you can put that into one transaction with inside multi and exec, and, uh, and you have to update two data structures. 
using two commands, HM set and Z add. <coughs> and in the second example, we are updating just one element. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm updating product and I'm updating the price uh, for one of the products. And you can see what I'm doing here. <coughs> right. Um, now we'll go to the second topic, which is session store. Now, session stores are a little different from cache. Now, in cache, the data that you store in cache is accessed by, usually accessed by all the users. Whereas in session store, uh, the data that's accessed by a session, it's not shared between sessions. They are, in other words, they're isolated. And also, um, when a session is live, you want to uh, you want to give an engaged, a highly engaged experience. So the data goes back and forth between um, your user session and the database. You don't really go and access data from your backend database. So the, the data lifecycle is here is a bit different, as you can see here on the screen. So when the session is on, uh, you're reading and writing back to your front end database. <coughs> How do you design a session store in Redis? Uh, here is an example of sessions and a shopping cart. Uh, you can see that. Now, uh, just like we designed a cache, uh, we have a few steps to design a session store in Redis. Um, and the steps are very similar to what you had uh, uh, in the previous use case. You have to identify the tables that you're already using as session store in MySQL, and you have to determine the Redis equivalent data structures, and then um, get all the queries and develop Redis equivalents. It's again the same as in the past. Um, there is no time to live or eviction here in case of session store. Uh, so you have to do a proper capacity planning um, and um, you should avoid evicting objects out of your session store. You should keep your objects in session store when the sessions are live. So you should do a proper capacity planning here. Um, and then um, you should have a proper policy to load the data from MySQL to session. And when the session is done, how do you synchronize the data back with MySQL? You should have a proper procedure. Um, and the last step is you have to modify your applications. Okay, um, and as you can see in this example, um, I'm using two data structures hash and sorted set, but one difference from the previous example is um, I'm having one sorted set um, object or one, one data structure for each user. So each user uh, or each session has its own shopping cart. Um, and when I say its own shopping cart, it has its own sorted set object, right? Okay, let's look at some query examples. In the first one, I'm, I'm getting all the products that are in the shopping cart. Um, here, what I'm doing is uh, in SQL, the select product SKU quantity from shopping cart, uh, where session ID is so and so. In Redis, uh, you have to run the command Z range by score shopping cart. You're appending the session ID to your shopping cart. And as I said earlier, uh, you can create uh, a key the way you want. Uh, here in this in this case, I'm using underscore as a delimiter. Um, a colon as a delimiter is also very popular in Redis. So here I'm running Z range by score shopping cart um, so and so. That's a, a sorted set from zero to infinity with scores, and that will give me uh, all the uh, all the items that are in shopping cart along with the quantity. Now, if you are inserting something to a shopping cart, um, it's the command Z add. In Redis, uh, in SQL, you used insert into shopping cart. And the equivalent in Redis is the add. Okay, so that's about um, so, so session store. And uh, before we go to the next use case, it's very important to know the differences between the cache and the session store um, and uh, make sure you understand the differences properly. And session store <coughs> requires not only high availability, you also need durability. So if your node uh, fails, you make sure you have a data uh, replication turned on so you have primary and secondary data. So if your primary database goes down, uh, make sure your sessions are still uh, available in your secondary. Uh, and also turn on persistence. So 
so that if your node is shut down and when you bring it up again, uh, all your session data is intact. Okay, uh, the next use case that we discussed today is about metering. And uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, Home Depot used metering uh, to rate limit the number of calls made to their legacy systems. And that way they prevented um, having a breakdown uh, of their database and they, they prevented the cascading effect that it had on all the apps. <clears throat> Right. Now, rate limiting is one use case for metering, and there are many other metering use cases. We also did a webinar on metering, and uh, we have we have a white paper that we have published. It has a lot of material, um, a lot of uh, code examples on how you can do metering with Redis. And uh, why is Redis so popular for metering? First of all, Redis has built-in counters. Uh, it's a data structure, so you can you can count uh, trillions, trillions and trillions of objects. And um, and also it is a it, it is a single threaded system. It's it's very important because you cannot have multiple threads uh, having any kind of collision. Uh, since Redis is a sing single threaded system, uh, the data is always consistent. It's always serialized. So if you are updating counter, uh, you always have uh, a consistent value. Now, Redis also has this feature for time to live. We saw this example in case of cache. Um, uh, when we used look aside cache, uh, I suggested that you should have a time to live to remove stale objects. Now, when it comes to metering, you can use the same feature uh, for a different purpose. We'll see an example here on the next slide. Um, here, uh, here, I'm just designing a very, very simple uh, rate limiter. Uh, you, you can, I'm sure you'll appreciate uh, how easy it is to develop uh, such things using Redis. Here I'm using only two Redis commands. One is incr or increment, I-N-C-R, and the other command I use here is expire. Now expire expires the key. Uh, it, it determines the time to live. So with just these two commands, uh, I can, I can uh, write a, a very simple rate limiting, limiting algorithm. So in this example, um, I, I just made this up. So uh, the goal here is to allow only 300,000 calls per minute. So I have 60 seconds, and I can call. I can make only 300,000 calls. Um, so if if the number of calls is less than 300,000, it's it's good to go. But if it reaches 300,000, then you have to stop. So that's the idea. So uh, where I start here is I initiate uh, initialize counter uh, using INCR call counter. I'm using the key call counter. That's my counter. Uh, and what INCR does is um, if the key exists, it will increment the value. If the key does not exist, it will create a new key with the key specified, and it will initiate that to zero. So um, in this case, I have INCR call counter if the key exists it will increment, otherwise it will set it to zero. So if the counter is less than 300,000, we are good to go. And if the counter is zero, that means I'm initializing the key for the first time, uh, I will set an expiration time of 60 seconds. Uh, in your use case, it could be something else. This is just an example where you're calling, where you're limiting 300,000 calls per, uh, per minute. Um, so you can expire your key uh, based on time. Uh, and uh, and the good thing here is you, you just run this algorithm, and if you are within the limits and if the key is still valid, you can run your DB query. Uh, if not, you have to go back and you have to retry after a while. So that's how you can, um, uh, you can limit the number of calls. And um, on, this, uh, on this site, on GitHub, we have some examples. We have some code examples um, uh, that will show you how to do traffic shaping, rate limiting. We have a a generic cell uh, rate limiter um, that will that can shape uh, the number of calls. I'll give a very quick demo here since we have some time. I'm using Eclipse, um, and I have a simple cell rate limiter. And what I'm doing is I'm making uh, 20 calls. Uh, all the calls they happen uh, in a few milliseconds, but I have a rate limiter. Uh, with a window of 20 and actions 10. What it means is uh, it says in 20 seconds you can have only 10 actions. So uh, this, is a, this is just an example. You can go to GitHub 
um, and you can download the code and you can see how this works. I'm just showing an example here. So you can see all the calls going in and uh, the calls are dripping out. So in happens very quickly, but out happens in drips. It, it goes one by one. And just for the sake of this demo, I have slowed down this system so much, but in real, uh, you don't have to slow down. Uh, you can have a, uh, a small window, but you can have more actions within the small window. Once again, you can go to github.com slash Redis Labs demo rate limiter and you can download um, the code sample. Okay. And if you have any questions on all these topics, you uh, please post your questions. I'll take your questions. I see some questions coming in, uh, but I'll uh, take these questions at the end. Okay. And uh, the next <clears throat> use case, um, a, a very good use case where you can complement your traditional database like MySQL with Redis is fast data ingest. Uh, we have seen this being used more and more in the IoT scenario and also in scenarios where they collect a lot of time series data uh, and logs. Now what's, uh, uh, what's happening most of the times is your database cannot support so many write operations. Um, so you have to have some, uh, some other data store that can accept a lot of data and uh, process that data in real time and uh, filter that data or transform that data and push it to your cold storage or some storage that's uh, used for um, some other purpose. Um, Redis has very powerful data structures, as I said, and also it has PubSub capab capabilities. I'll do a demo in a while and show how you can do PubSub in Redis. Um, what's cool about Redis is since it, it writes data in memory, data reads and data writes, they, they have the same performance. They're extremely fast. So you can do millions of uh, writes per second um, and you can still stay up, right? <coughs> now Redis for fast data ingest. Um, you can see on the screen, um, I have three examples, PubSub lists and sorted sets. Uh, I'll do a quick demo of PubSub. Now, PubSub capability in Redis is, is very interesting. It's very easy to use. It's one of our top use cases. Um, you can publish to a channel, and you can have multiple subscribers who subscribe to the channel, and they all get that message. Um, now, it is good because it's easy. It's asynchronous. You can have a lot of subscribers. Uh, and all of them will get the message with some millisecond latency. So it's 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 heavily used. Uh, it, in fact, um, it's one of the top use cases. We have about 70% of our users, of our uh, customers who use Redis uh, for PubSub capabilities. Now, um, PubSub has one small drawback, where, uh, and that is if a subscriber is down, let's say in this left top left example, subscriber one is down, um, and the data is coming in, uh, there is no reconnect and there, there is no uh, way you can, a subscriber when, uh, one can fetch the data uh, uh, that's lost. So we do, that's not available in PubSub. But you can use other data structures if that is a requirement. For example, in list, you can maintain a list for each subscriber and you can push data to the list. And, uh, and if the data, if the subscriber is down, the data is still intact in Redis. So when the subscriber one comes back up, um, this object, subscriber one can fetch all the data uh, that's stored in the list. And also there is asynchronous call called BR pop. It's a blocking call, uh, or it could be BL pop uh, in Redis. And, uh, and you can do, you can do asynchronous, asynchronous push um, using list data structure. Now, sorted set um, is interesting again. Now, as you may see here, list, if you have thousands of subscribers, you have to maintain a separate list for each subscriber. Uh, but in case of sorted sets, you just have one sorted set where you're pushing all the data and uh, you have to maintain uniqueness. You can append the timestamp uh, to make each data unique. Um, and all the subscribers that can pull the data uh, whenever they want. So it has its own advantages. Um, advantages are you don't have to duplicate data, but the disadvantage is um, uh, you have to pull the data. Now, um, just to keep
keep in mind, Redis is going to have a new data structure called Redis Streams. So it is work in progress. It is going to be released in a month or two. So please stay tuned, and uh, that will really revolutionize um, stream handling in Redis. So I'll do a, uh, before we go to the next topic, I'll do a quick demo uh, in Redis. Uh, PubSub, I'll just do a quick demo. Once again, you can go to GitHub slash Redis Labs demo, and you can get all these uh, examples. So here in Ingest PubSub, what I'm doing is I'm collecting all information and collecting a lot of tweets, and um, I'm, uh, I'm filtering tweets based on the influencers, and I'm, I'm, I'm preparing a list of uh, influencers, and I'm deciding whether uh, an influ whether a person is influencer or not based on the follower count. If the follower count is more than 10,000, I'm uh, flagging that user, Twitter user, as an influencer. So let me flush all the data in Redis. Okay, and now let me start this. So as you, you will see, all the tweets coming in. So I'm listening to tweets in real time. So all the tweets are flowing in. So let's see how many uh, influencers we have collected so far. So I'll do, I'm putting all the influencers into a sorted set data structure because I'll have the influencer name and also the number of followers. So I'll do a Z card on influencers. So I have 19 influencers collected so far, 20. So it's growing, 21. So uh, you can do a lot of things here. So let's see who is the top. I can do Z rev range by score from um, plus infinity to zero. Oops, I have to do this on influencers. Okay, so these are all the top influencers. You can see uh, the top influencers we have collected so far. We have 38 already. So we have 41 already. And it's going on. And also, as part of this demo, you can download this uh, from Redis Labs demo, github.com, redislabs.demo. Um, I'm also collecting the popular uh, hashtags. So I have a hashtag set. So let me see Z card hashtag set. So I have about 336 hashtags collected. If I do a Z rev range by score, on hashtag set, I'll, let's see what are the popular hashtags from infinity. Since I have a lot of them, I'll try to restrict. So the most popular uh, hashtags that I'm collecting are job, hiring, and career arc. Uh, okay, these happen to be the most popular ones right now, uh, trending on Twitter. Right. So um, this is just a quick demo on how you can use Redis PubSub. Um, and once again, you can go to Redis Labs. Um, you can go to github.com and uh, Redis Labs demo and get this. Okay, with that, um, Redis um, is popular for caching, se caching, session store, metering, fast data ingest, but it's also used in many, many more use cases. It's used as a primary database. We have a lot of customers who use Redis as a primary database. One good thing here is uh, by using Redis as a primary database, you don't need a front end database. Redis uh, itself becomes your full-fledged database. And with persistence and durability options that are available in Redis Enterprise, uh, it is a possibility. And we, ha we are seeing more and more customers um, who, are, who are saying, hey, why do we need two tiers of databases? We'll just use Redis uh, Enterprise as our primary database. Um, and, uh, and also it's affordable, so let's do it. So that we have many customers who do this. And also other Popular use cases are real-time analytics, messaging. We saw pops up just now. Uh, it's also used for recommendations. We have some white papers on recommendations. Um, if you're interested, you may want to check out. Uh, it's used for high-speed transactions. In fact, that's our number two uh, use case. And uh, we have Redis Search module. It's a very popular search engine. Uh, and it has geo-indexing, geospatial indexing. So you can run. Um, some geo queries, you can get all the, uh, uh, okay. for example, if you, if you index all the uh, business establishments near a location, you can get all the hotels, all the restaurants near one place, for example. So uh, in a nutshell, Redis 
is a front-end database. It has data structures. It's extremely fast, and it's like a Swiss Army knife for data processing. And it has many use cases. You can use it in many ways. Now, Redis Enterprise. Um, <clears throat> as I said earlier, Redis Labs uh, has Redis Enterprise. It delivers Redis Enterprise. Now, it takes Redis to the enterprises, uh, to the enterprise world um, through Redis Enterprise. As I said earlier, Redis is an open source database. Um, and also, Redis is a single threaded system. So if you're running Redis on a on a 16 core CPU, it runs on only one core. So you're not really maximizing all the cores. Um, but with Redis Enterprise, what you can do is you can create a cluster of 16 uh, Redis instances, and uh, you get you get higher throughput, a lot a lot higher throughput with Redis Enterprise, and you can maximize uh, your CPU usage. And also, you have um, high availability, durability. Uh, you have robust security. So if you have any compliance requirements. Uh, Redis Enterprise delivers uh, very good security. Um, and also, uh, Redis Enterprise has active active capability. So you can have a multi-master setup um, across your distributed data, uh, data centers. And the um, good thing is it is CRDT-based. You know, CRDT is a new, uh, very new technique in, in the world of computer science. And uh, Redis Enterprise is one of the first databases to to implement a CRDT-based active-active database. Uh, for more information, you can go to our website and uh, learn more about CRDT. CRDT stands for Conflict-Free Replicated Data Type. Um, and you can build a multi-master database, uh, uh, which is distributed across data centers. And you don't have to worry about uh, data conflict or synchronization. Redis Enterprise takes care of that. Um, and also, uh, Redis Enterprise has Redis on Flash. Um, if you have a very large data set, uh, data set in many gigabytes or terabytes, uh, you can you can reduce your cost by using uh, Redis uh, by using Flash as a RAM extender. So uh, in this case, all the hot data is stored in RAM, and uh, the cold data. What Redis Enterprise does is it pushes uh, the cold data to flash. Um, so it, it follows a tiered memory model. Right? So now uh, the advantages of Redis Enterprise, if you are using Redis Enterprise for your caching, uh, session store, metering, or fast data ingest, um, uh, the benefits are, first of all, it will help you um, run your business during peak usage. Uh, so you are covered. It, it, it gets you covered during peak usage, and it prevents st cache stampede um, by using uh, primary and secondary database, uh, uh, primary and secondary. We do replication, and if one node goes down, uh, automatically the other node comes up, and uh, you won't experience any kind of cache stampede, which is a very popular problem when you don't have uh, data replication turned on. Um, and then it, it delivers consistent high performance, and um, and it has zero time scaling. So if you are resharding or rebalancing your data, you're adding new shards, you're balancing data, rebalancing, uh, there is no downtime. There is zero downtime. You don't have to shut down your apps or databases. All of this can be done uh, by having Redis Enterprise running. So uh, that's that's really cool. So we talked about security, and we talked about performance, and we also talked about active active. Now another good thing about active active is if you're having session stores or cache, uh, you can distribute your session stores and cache across all your data centers. So if your app moves from one data center to another data center, you don't worry, you don't have to worry about migrating um, your objects from uh, one data center to another. It's all automatically synchronized inside Redis Enterprise. And Redis on Flash will allow you, especially if you're using uh, session store, uh, you don't have to expire uh, your session. So you can uh, have all the session data in, in Redis as long as you want, um, and the data will uh, automatically overflow to Flash if RAM gets full. So that's that's very interesting. Right? Uh, as I said earlier, uh, Redis powers a range of solutions, and what you see on our screen, on the screen here, is uh, the result of our survey uh, of our customers. 
So we asked our customers, hey, why do you use Redis Enterprise? And, uh, and we got some answers. <coughs> and what you see on the left is the solutions they're using Redis Enterprise in, um, e-commerce, social, uh, personalization, IoT, these are all very popular use cases. Um, and what you see on the right is um, how they're using Redis. Uh, you can see session store and high-speed transactions going neck to neck. They are the top two use cases. Uh, there's caching, job queue management, messaging, and many more. Right. Now, if you ask, um, how do you, how can you get Redis Enterprise? Uh, we deliver Redis Enterprise in three deployment models. Uh, one is cloud. Um, Redis Enterprise, you don't have to do anything. You can just sign up for now, and uh, you don't even have to give your credit card information. You can sign up and get Redis Cloud. Uh, it's free up to 30 MB. <coughs> so you can go to redislabs.com and get started, and you can sign up for cloud service, and you can deploy Redis Cloud uh, on uh, Redis Enterprise on cloud on any of the popular cloud platforms. Uh, and also we have Redis Enterprise on VPC. If you have a virtual private cloud in Amazon, or if you have VNet uh, on Azure, or if you have a virtual environment in Google Cloud Platform, uh, or IBM software, <coughs> we can um, we can deploy Redis Enterprise inside your virtual uh, environment, virtual private cloud. Um, and in this case, the cool thing is you are in charge of data. The data resides in your in your virtual environment, and um, and uh, we can manage the services. Uh, we manage the Redis services, and we won't have access to the data. You alone have access to the data. <coughs> And the last one is Redis software, Redis Enterprise software. Um, Redis Enterprise software is the only uh, commercially available downloadable software um, for Redis. Um, and you can download Redis Enterprise software from our website, um, and you can deploy it wherever you want, in any data center you want, in your private data center, or you can deploy it um, on cloud or anywhere. It can run anywhere. It, it can even run on your... Um, on your PC or laptop, uh, uh, you can you can download. Right. So, um, in conclusion, um, we talked about four challenges, and uh, the answer to the four challenges is obviously Redis. And uh, we say Redis because of uh, these reasons: uh, simplicity. We talked about Redis data structures and performance. Uh, Redis beats all other databases in performance. And it's extremely fast being in memory database. It can perform 1 million writes or reads per second, or more than multi million reads or writes per second. Um, and it can support many use cases ranging from caching, session store, fast data ingest, and metering. And, uh, and also, we talked about Redis Enterprise, um, which, which you can deploy it, uh, for your enterprise needs. Okay, so, so that is the um, webinar for today, and now uh, let me take some questions that are coming here. So let me look at the screen. The first question is, um, how do you get a higher throughput on Redis Enterprise? Uh, as I said earlier, uh, Redis, um, open source Redis is a single threaded process. Um, so if you're running Redis on multiple cores, uh, you're really using just one core. Um, so what Redis Enterprise does is it will allow you to create uh, multiple processes and it uh, you can run multiple shards and uh, you can maximize throughput you can run redis on all the core cpu cores and uh, and redis enterprise has something called a zero lati latency proxy so um, with zero latency proxy uh, you don't have to worry about data partitioning or anything um, redis enterprise will take care of that so you can run multiple processes of redis and uh, get the highest throughput the second question is, uh, does active active feature on Redis support eventual consistency? Um, uh, okay, now let me clarify one thing here. Uh, active active feature is available on Redis Enterprise only, and um, it does support eventual consistency. In fact, it supports strong eventual consistency. Uh, I recommend that you should read uh, uh, read more about CRDT, conflict free replicated data type. You can go to our website and uh, read more about CRDT. Um, and we do active-active uh, 
uh, we, we do support active active database distributed database uh, based on CRDT the next question is um, how to cache Java objects in Redis uh, okay uh, let me pause for a second here now Redis is is binary compliant uh, what I mean by that is if you have a uh, if you have any data that is in binary format, you can you can store that in Redis. You can all you need is a byte array, and uh, it is Redis is binary safe. Uh, you can store any binary objects like videos or even images or anything, even Java objects. But uh, you should understand the purpose. Now, why do you want to cache Java objects? Is, is it because you are storing um, the data inside the objects? If you are storing data inside the objects, um, you should know that you are serializing and deserializing uh, and if you're doing that often uh, that may not be a good thing for you so uh, you should you should try it out uh, maybe it is better for you not to store the objects but to store take the data out of objects and store the data itself uh, so depending on your use case I suggest uh, that you try out uh, storing both objects and the data and see what what best works for you and then, um, can we sort with other field rather than key? Um, I did not uh, really understand the question. I guess the question is with respect to sorted sets. Uh, in sorted sets, you have uh, um, it's not a key. You're, you're not sorting based on a key. Uh, it is a score. Uh, every item in a sorted set has a score. And you uh, you sort based on the score. Okay. Next question here is what is the difference? What is the comparison between uh, Redis and Snowflake? Uh, I don't have um, a comparison right now, uh, but I can get back to you. I don't have any comparison as of now on that. Um, we are using Redis in one of our messaging framework uh, due to its strong features. I want to know. Where can I get the best study material uh, to Redis to start from scratch? Um, I also like to talk about Redis more. Okay, um, uh, this is good. Um, now, uh, very soon we are going to start uh, uh, a Redis University, and uh, you will you will be able to enroll and learn more. Uh, stay tuned, please stay tuned. Uh, but before that, you can get started. Um, with a lot of material on our website, uh, we have a um, we have a textbook on Redis uh, written by Josiah Carlson. You can download that uh, textbook and you can read and uh, you can come up to speed. And also, you can um, you you have you have a lot of resources for Redis. You can try something called try.redis.io um, to get started. In my opinion, that's a very good place to start. Okay, and the next question is. Uh, how do you compare to GPU databases for performance? Uh, we don't have any benchmarks as of now, but um, uh, when it comes to GPU, GPUs are based on cell architecture, whereas Redis it relies on on RAM and uh, in-memory computation, and it's more data data-based computation. So um, it's not a we don't have matrix computations. Uh, so uh, I really wonder if we can get any boost using GPU-based um, uh, uh, processes. But with that said, uh, uh, that's that's one of the projects that we have on our plate. Uh, we want to see how we perform on uh, on a GPU. Uh, how to handle JSON data um, in Redis? Oh, okay, very good question. Now there is a uh, JSON module, re-JSON module. Uh, you can import re-JSON module and uh, and store your uh, JSON data in its in its format. Uh, and also, um, if you are using Lua script, uh, it has a, it ha it supports JSON. That's another way. But you should be very careful when you use Lua scripting in Redis uh, because all the calls are uh, uh, they 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 are atomic. Uh, and if you're running Lua script in loops, then it will block other calls. Uh, could you compare uh, Redis PubSub with MQTT, uh, for example? Uh, 
Uh, okay, uh, this is a very good example. Uh, we don't have any comparison as such, but we have a lot of IoT customers who are using Redis, um, and, um, and I can get back to you with more information uh, about how we compare against against MQTT. Um, and uh, and also, if you have any questions, I can put you in touch with our customers, IoT customers, uh, who tested all the MQTT-based um, uh, communication, and uh, they're using PubSub, and they're very happy with PubSub. Okay. Now, do you integrate with AWS databases uh, such as Aurora, MySQL, Postgres? Okay, uh, it's not a question of integrating. We complement with uh, Aurora is another SQL-based database, right? So uh, we complement with any SQL-based database. Um, uh, and uh, Redis, you should look at Redis. Uh, you can use Redis as a primary database, or you can use it as a complement uh, to any other database. Uh, and uh, and I see that you have listed a few uh, few databases here, like MongoDB, Hadoop, Hive, Kafka. Uh, there are many cases where you can um, you can complement or you can replace an existing database. Uh, besides Java, what other languages is supported? Um, you can go to Redis.io and look at all the uh, clients available. We have um, we have about 60 plus. Uh, languages supported so we have libraries for 60 plus languages uh, there are many many more questions oh uh, there are a lot of questions i'm so sorry we are running out of time um we, we, i won't be able to take all these questions uh, but now i'll hand over to sharon and uh, she has some raffle um, and sharon please take it up hey roshan thank you and to those who uh, posted questions that we were not able to get to because there were so many uh, we will answer these directly uh, via email so yet another full hour and terrific questions and okay now it's time to give a shout out to our raffle winners of the 100 dollars amazon gift cards and the two complimentary passes to redis comp 18. so here we go our First winner of the Amazon $100 gift card is Sergio Bruno. All right. And the second winner is Tom Thomas Gilbert. Okay. And let's take a look at the Redis Comp winners. Our two winners of the complimentary passes to Redis Comp 18 are David Phillips and Andrew Wilkins. So congratulations to Sergio, Thomas, David, and Andrew. Ping us using the Q&A panel and provide us with your mobile number, and we will contact you shortly uh, via email and on your mobile. So we're at a, the end of another broadcast. On behalf of the entire Redis Labs team, thank you for joining us. An email will be sent with a link to the, to the recording of today's broadcast. Check out our future broadcasts at redislabs.com backslash webinars and register today. Until next time.